Please join me in welcoming to the National Press Club, Stephen King. Funny you would ask me that, since that just happens to be the uh, topic of my, uh, <clears throat> my little talk today, which will be fairly little, uh, since I'm supposed to be done by around 1.30 or something like that, which is probably a good idea. I couldn't believe it when I got here. We're on the 13th floor. <laughs> and they don't even joke about it. They don't screw around with it. It doesn't go 12, 14. It just goes 13. And you're here, and I'm supposed to talk here. And I've, I've got a real thing about that. Uh, I want to congratulate Joyce Winslow again for her, her uh, winning short story. And I, I was glad to hear her point out that uh, a number of journalists and uh, writers for newspapers actually wrote fiction and, and started the short story in America. I see a lot of that in the Bangor Daily News, my daily paper, even now. Um, Al Goldstein is a member now, I understand, and then you get Stephen King. You guys are on a roll <laughs> here at the press club. <laughs> maybe <laughs> Howard, and, Howard Stern, maybe next week. <laughs> Beavis and Butthead, yeah, yeah. Cool. Light something on fire, yeah. Uh, this, is, this has been a Stephen King kind of week, actually. I'm not going to do a comedy routine. Don't worry about that. Um, but... Uh, for those of you who want to, we are going to screen the program after this and then go lie down in the middle of Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> um, I was not always a uh, scary guy, and John Day, who is here uh, from my hometown paper, the Bangor Daily News, pointed that out to me. Uh, he brought a picture of me before I became uh, a fairly nice guy writing stuff like this. Um, that shows, it's a picture that sort of epitomizes the sweet and gentle person I once was before I was coarsened by what I'm doing for a living now. Um, at that time, I was a, a, a columnist for the main campus, which was uh, uh, the paper where I think John got his start and uh, where a lot of people who write up in Maine worked at one time or another. And uh, at that time, one of the staff photographers was a, uh, a young man named Frank Cady, who was a card-carrying communist and uh, SDS member. Hey, we were all sort of involved with that at that time. And what else we were sort of heavily involved with at that time was uh, uh, drugs and booze and sex. And uh, after a, a night of fairly heavy partying, in, this would have been in 1969, at uh, my apartment in, in uh, Vesey, Maine, where the biggest excitement is grass fire season. Um, that's what the, uh, the guy at the, at the store told me one time. He said, oh, it's not so much this time of year, but wait till grass fire season. We, we have a time then. So Frank came one Saturday morning after we'd all been up uh, partying until about 2 a.m. the night before, and he literally kicked me out of bed. My head was the size of, of, of a boulder, and he said, get up, Steve, I have an idea. He had cameras strung all over every visible part of his body. He said, we're going to go out and take some pictures which express the rage of the people. And I said, Frank, get out of here. I got a hangover, I'm going back to bed. And he said, no, we have to go out and take some pictures that express the rage of the people. So we went out, and I don't know about the rage of the people, but by the time we got out there in six inches of snow, and I was in cut-off rubber boots, and I had a hangover, I was in a rage by then, and Frank got some great pictures, and one of them appeared on the front page of the, uh, the uh, main campus and uh, became a poster up there, study them at around the time of finals. And since John brought it, just, just a minute, I will show you that I, I'm not always the degenerate you see before you today. I think this is it. See, I was all right at that time. <laughs> I think the shotgun was unloaded, but I never bothered to, to check. No, actually, here at the uh, press club, they, they asked me um, what I wanted to talk about. And I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? And they said, anything you want to talk about. And I said, well, that's fine. What do you want me to talk about? And they said, anything you want to talk about. And we went around back and forth like that 
for about three weeks. I approach this speaking date as I approach all speaking dates with the idea that I will probably die before it happens, and I don't really have to worry about that anyway. Uh, and then about two days before, I decide that, that I may actually have to go through it uh, with it, at least partially, there's always the possibility of dying in mid-course. Uh, like J.R.R. Rodale on the Dick Cavett Show, uh, whose last words during the commercial break were, I feel fine. <laughs> True story. I save things like that. What was I talking about? Um, anyway, so I said, well, I'll talk about uh, how a nice guy like me got into a job like this and would give me a chance to talk a little bit about uh, my, my early days, most of, most of which have been thoughtfully covered now, thanks to my introduction. But uh, that's, that's okay. Um, I was always interested in fantasy. I was a fantasy writer uh, from the very beginning, from the time when I first uh, picked up a pen and discovered how fast the time passed when I was making things up in my mind. Um, I wrote fairy tales, I wrote science fiction, I wrote fantasy, and around the time that I was a senior in, in high school, when I won my own writer's contest, it was a scholastic magazine contest, I, I got an honorable mention. I won a pen that worked for a week, and then <laughs> it quit. There's a picture of me in the uh, high school yearbook, looking suitably goony, though, accepting this award from the, from the guidance counselor, who later went to Section 8 in Vietnam. But that's another story altogether. Uh, fantasy was what, what intrigued me and what interested me. Uh, and by the time I went to college, I went on a number of, uh, a cobbled together package of scholarships, merit scholarships, and then there was a little uh, uh, money for working on the University of Maine dish line. And uh, I worked a number of different jobs. And uh, managed to put together enough with the help of my mother to pay tuition, room and board, and there was very little left over. And uh, once I moved out of the dormitory situation, uh, room was okay, board was really skimp skimpy. There were a lot of meals of uh, Franco-American spaghetti and uh, the king's specialty at that time, which was fried Cheerios with peanut butter. Uh, still good on Saturday night, once in a while. And they don't do to you what beans will, so there. Uh, anyway, there was not much to eat, and at, by that time I was submitting stories on a regular basis, and I'd started to get that most irritating response for the young writer, and a lot of you will know about this. This is the letter, the personal letter, somehow the, the form rejections are easier to take, the personal letter that comes and says, this is a really good story, not quite good enough for us, but not bad. You almost made $2,000 from Playboy, but not quite. And it's a little bit like teasing the family dog. Here, want it? Want it? Whoop. Can't quite have it. So I was in that stage, and around that time I was, you know, uh, checking the uh, writer's books, the writer's markets, and all that. And I saw that there were companies that would actually pay $500 to $750 for sex novels. These were companies like uh, Midwood Books, Beeline Books, my favorite was Cozy Books, that's with a K. Their motto was Cozy Up with Cozy Books. <laughs> but the one that actually looked sort of almost like if you, if you squinted and tried hard, you could think of them as literate, was Olympia Books. They were printed in San Diego, but they had an Eiffel Tower on the front, so <laughs> you knew that they were trying to be classy anyway. And I thought, geez, $750, and if I can write, oh, let's say 10,000 words a day for five days, that's $750 a week. So I sat down, and it was my only real stab at that, at that kind of fantasy, although sometimes I think in a lot of my early career, the subject of sex keeps circling back sort of around the edges of things. Uh, I got about 40 pages in and had exhausted most of the permutations my brain could think of. <laughs> And uh, when I got to the uh, twin sisters in the birdbath, I said, this is, this is not happening for me. And I threw it away and soldiered on. My first sales came to uh, uh, the magazine of startling stories. There were two sales uh, the year that I was 22, which was 1969, a year rapidly receding into the past. Uh, this was one of a small magazine empire uh, called Heath Knowledge, the, f the flagship, and a tattered old flagship it was of the line, was a magazine called Sexology. It was sort of a 
forerunner of the penthouse forum. And uh, what I remember about it was that there was a lot of thrusting hardness and a lot of <laughs> moist, deep caves or something like that. Uh, but they did pay. And uh, I, I wasn't published in, uh, in uh, sexology, but in, in the uh, little or known magazines. I went on uh, after having employed my uh, college degree, my, my BS, you all know what that stands for, I don't need to tell you that, uh, to get an a interesting, fulfilling, high-paying job washing motel sheets at the New Franklin Laundry in Bangor. I started to sell short stories to a, a magazine called Cavalier, um, which had girls with the biggest breasts <clears throat> I have ever seen in my life. And of course, I was telling my mother that I had sold some stories and I was actually supplementing my income as a laundry worker with, with fiction. And she wanted to see some of the stories. And you want to believe there was some careful Xeroxing that went on. <laughs> We're talking about serious masking. It was okay on the, the, the front pages, but as you went into the back, the ads for the uh, creative blow-up toys would sort of proliferate. <laughs> And uh, most of those stories were, were published in, um, in uh, an early book of mine called Night Shift. Uh, and two of them, one of them was actually made into a movie called Graveyard Shift, which is better forgotten. And another one is in progress now. Uh, this was followed by my novel, Carrie, uh, which my wife did indeed fish out of the wastebasket. But it was not a finished manuscript at that time. It was about nine pages. I'd started it with the idea that it might make a nice story for Cavalier or possibly Playboy, one of the men's magazines anyway. And uh, we counted on that money by that time. Those people were buying our kids antibiotics for their ear infections. Uh, my memory of children from the ages of 18 months to four years is one constant ear infection, always at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and that the medication was pink and very expensive. Anyway, I didn't have time to fool around basically, and uh, I saw at once that Carrie was going to re require a much longer fuse to be laid than with a lot of the other short stories I was selling at that time, so I threw it in the wastebasket. My wife fished it out, read the first scene, which is set in a girl's locker room, where this girl who knows nothing about menstruation has her first period, and my wife said, I really like this, and I think you should go on with it, and uh, she was amused, and the the quality of her amusement has always reminded me since uh, of uh, Samuel Johnson's comment about women preachers and dancing dogs. He said, it isn't that you expect to see it done well, you're surprised to see it done at all. And that seemed to be her attitude toward my take on women at that time. Anyway, the book sold. Um, and uh, by the time that uh, the paperback rights went up for sale, we were living in a $70 a month apartment in one of Bangor's finer neighborhoods, Sanford Street. You may remember where that is, John. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's uh, Bangor's answer, I guess, to the, to the ghetto, you'd say. It's, it's a, it was a terrible place. And uh, my editor called one Sunday and said that uh, Doubleday had sold paperback rights for $400,000. And I couldn't believe it. I kept asking him, did he mean $40,000? Because that was a figure I could at least cope with on some level. And he said, no, $400,000. Finally, after he'd said that four or five times, uh, I hung up and walked back and forth through the apartment. My wife was out. I didn't know exactly what to do with myself. Uh, it was Sunday. Everything was closed. So finally, I, I went downtown and bought her a hairdryer. Uh, <laughs> It was, it was the only thing that I could think of to do, and it was the only place that was open. And part of being Stephen King was I was convinced every time I crossed the street that I would be run over and killed at that, <laughs> at that moment. Uh, which brings me to the, I suppose, to the point that I want to make. Uh, uh, not very long after that, my editor said, we need a follow-up for this book. And I had written two novels during the period after completing Carrie and by the time Carrie was published, which was a space of about 18 months. Uh, one of them was, an, was a straight suspense novel about a kidnapping, and the other one was a, uh, a story about, about vampires. Um, and if I want to leave you with anything, I, I want to leave you with something that uh, sort of amuses me and amazes me both at the same time. I don't know when we talk about the great changes in our lives, whether we're talking about luck, whether we're talking about fate, or whether we're talking about God. All I know for sure is that there are times that come in a person's life, there are watershed moments that usually come and go fairly rapidly, and everything changes forever after that. 
And what interests me the most about these moments is, in most cases, we don't realize it when they happen. They come and go with the sort of humdrum uh, quality of all the rest of our lives. There's no Hollywood music, there are no drums, there are no spotlights, just moments that come and go. Anyway, one of these novels I've read since. I pulled it out of the drawer. It's never been published. It is the, the suspense novel, which was about a kidnapping. It was called Blaze. And when I read it, and I did read it all the way to the end, I thought of a comment made by Oscar Wilde once, who said that it was impossible to read the story of the poor little match girl without bursting into tears of utter hilarity. And uh, tears of laughter, I think he said. And, and that's the way it, it is with Blaze, only worse. It's an absolutely terrible novel. And I can't imagine uh, what would have uh, happened or what would have become of me if that novel had been published at that particular time in my career. Because a writer's career is like a plant. The conditions for that plant to grow have to be exactly right. And uh, for an awful lot of writers, those conditions don't conspire. In my case, they happen to. The other novel at that time was titled Second Coming, and it was a perfectly good suspense novel. I'm not talking great, but I'm saying it was a good novel that did the job. It just happened to be about vampires. My editor was a man named Bill Thompson, and he and I were walking up Park Avenue toward 52nd Street when I asked him which of the novels he liked. It was a possibility in my mind at that time that he might say he didn't like either of them. And he said with great reluctance that he liked the novel Second Coming, which later became Salem's Lot. And I, I, said, I was re relieved that he liked it, but I was curious about why he sounded so reluctant, as though that judgment were being dragged out of him. And at this point, we reached the corner of 52nd Street, the cross street with Park, and the Don't Walk light was on. And it changed to walk. As he said to me, I'm afraid you'll become typed as a horror writer if you follow this story of the girl who's telekinetic with the vampire novel. And I thought about that as I crossed from one side of 52nd Street, where I lived one life, to the other side of 52nd Street, where everything changed, although I didn't know that then. And what I said as we got about halfway across the street was, if people want to call me a horror writer, they can call me a horror writer. They can call me anything that they want, as long as they don't call me late to dinner. And uh, those are my exact words. I'm not making a joke. And uh, by the time that we got to 52nd Street, uh, it was done uh, the other side of 52nd. It was a done deal. And uh, a young writer who had published one book had become what would start to be called uh, uh, the horror meister or the master of horror or the king of horror, whatever phrase your newspaper people are using this particular week. Um, everything changed. And since then, I've become sort of uh, typecast as a, as a writer. But that's all right with me. I made up my mind that I would never complain about that, and I would certainly never deny it as long as people kept allowing me to write the things that I wanted and the checks didn't bounce. <laughs> and so far, both of those things have happened. And in the meantime, I've had a chance to do some fairly subversive things under the guise of, of the, uh, the horror story. I got to write about alcoholism and the disintegration of the nuclear family and The Shining. And, in the stand, I got a chance to write about what happens when we finally realize that our technology has outraced our morality. In the dead zone, I got a chance to talk about the alienation of the prodigy, the person who knows something or can do something that's different from everyone else. Got to talk about adolescent rites of passage in the body and the, the healing power of memory, which is something I felt very strongly when I was writing it. Uh, in Needful Things, I got to talk about greed in the 80s and how funny greed really is when you get right down to it, and how hilarious it was to be an American during the eight years of the Reagan administration. On one level, it really was a scream to be there. <laughs> it's just to, later on, my kids are just going to say to their kids, no, you, you, you had to be there. You can't believe what you read in the history books. You can't credit it, but you just had to be there. And in a book like Gerald's Game, I even got to talk about how hard it is to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, basically, everything that I've written, and I'm winding up, I'm winding up, don't pull me off yet, ah, back, back, <laughs> psycho, weak, weak, <laughs> never mind. Um, I guess I'd, I'd say in, in conclusion that uh, I found this uh, tremendously uh, fulfilling, exciting, and, and optimistic job to do. Um, I've experienced at first hand the power of fantasy to uh, heal fear, 
and hope people and and help people uh, cope with their own mortality and their own terrors of daily life, and uh, even more than that, to try and discuss on some level the seeming randomness of of daily life and why uh, things happen as they do. There's a story in uh, my new book, which is called uh, The Moving Finger. The book is called Nightmares and Dreamscapes, and just coincidentally, it is available at a fine bookstore <laughs> near you today from Viking. But The Moving Finger is a story about an accountant from Queens who uh, goes to the bathroom one night and this finger pokes out of the bathroom drain. And uh, this is disturbing to Howard Mintler, <laughs> the accountant because drains don't usually give birth to fingers but even more so he's one of these people who finds it very impossible almost impossible to urinate with somebody in the room even if it's just a finger sticking out of the drain and uh, the story traces his mental and emotional downfall as a result of this finger which appears to continue to get longer and longer and Howard in the story is a jeopardy freak and uh, he has a dream about this finger one night where he is on Jeopardy with Alex Trebek. In fact, he's on Final Jeopardy, where the category is the inexplicable. And uh, the, uh, the, final Jeopardy, uh, the Final Jeopardy answer is because they can. And uh, the Final Jeopardy question is, why do bad things sometimes happen to the nicest people? And it seems to me that that's what a lot of my work has been about. And, uh, of course, when you deal with things of this nature, the answer always comes first and the question comes later. <laughs> Do you have any questions for me? <laughs> Thank you. The first questions are in the form of a letter. <laughs> my name is Andrea Copeland. I'm 11 years old. The reason I'm writing to you is because my reading class is doing a report on our favorite author, and you are mine. The first question is, what made you start writing books and making movies? And how did you think of the movies Gradia Graveyard Shift and Sleepwalkers? Well, I started writing books because it seemed like a natural outgrowth of um, writing short stories. They grew like Topsy. My first novels were all short novels. One of them that was published under the Richard Bachman name, The Running Man, was written in a week. It was a, I was teaching school at the time and it was February vacation and it was snowing and I thought, what the hell, I'll write a book. So I did and it actually turned into a movie much later on and uh, I think Again, as I said about Carrie, it was not something that I intended to write as a novel. I didn't feel that I had time to write a novel uh, at, uh, at that time. But for me, actually writing, sitting down and writing a novel is still always a surprise. It feels almost like an unplanned pregnancy must feel to a woman. It's like, I didn't mean to be doing this this year. I got a thousand other things that I'd rather be doing. So they just sort of happen sometimes. Um, as far as what I think about the movies that you mentioned, I like Sleepwalkers quite well, and I don't like Graveyard Shift very much at all. It's been consigned to Joe Bob Briggs' drive-in theater on Showtime, and that's a good place for it. Could you explain how it came about that you wrote fiction under the pen name of Bachman? I'm not sure I can explain anything about <laughs> anything, but uh, I had written a number of novels, uh, that were not like the sort of things that I discussed with Bill Thompson as, with his fears of me being typecast. They were, some of them were fantasy. Uh, there was one called The Long Walk, which was a fantasy novel, and there was one called uh, The Running Man, which was uh, uh, a science fiction novel, and the other two, although it's a lot different from the movie with Arnold, um, the other two were more or less straight novels, whatever that means. And uh, I was publishing at a rate at that time, they had my publishers nervous to begin with. They felt that I would get uh, overexposed. Uh, <laughs> here we are back at Howard Stern again. But uh, they, uh, if, the, the solution to this, it seemed to me, was to use a pen name. And I had no idea that the secret would ever come out. 
But then I began to get letters uh, saying, gee, there's a guy out there, we don't know if you know this, his name is Richard Bachman, he's ripping off your style. <laughs> and I would write back and say, oh, that's too bad, don't worry about it, I know the guy. And finally, I, I overreached myself. I wrote a novel called Thinner, which was a horror novel, and even though I put the photograph of an all-state tire salesman from Minnesota on the back, uh, a guy from Washington, D.C., who worked in a bookstore, went to the Library of Congress and uh, found out that uh, the copyright holder in the names both Stephen King and Richard Bachman were Stephen King, and I got the only uh, revenge I could get. I wrote a novel called The Dark Half and killed him off. <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld and Howard Stern are on the top of the bestsellers list. What does this tell you about the state of America's literature? Boy, that's a, that's a, a loaded question, isn't it? Uh, I don't think that it tells me anything um, about the state of American literature. I think that uh, they're sort of airplane books and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. We have to remember that years before Howard Stern wrote a book, or Jerry Seinfeld either. Uh, we had cat books, uh, we had uh, B. Kleban uh, publishing books. There's a guy now, I understand, who's published something called the Mafia Cookbook. I can't wait to get a hold of that one. Uh, so I would say that people have always had a, a, a good time in, in books, and, and sometimes, and as in the case of Madonna, they've had maybe a little bit too good of a time <laughs> in, in books, but hey, who am I to say? Um, on the whole, I haven't read either book, so maybe I better stop right there before I put my foot in my mouth, where it's very comfortable. <laughs> what advice do you have for young writers to become better writers, or maybe even novelists? Well, you have to write a lot, and I'm sure that Joyce knows that. Uh, you have to write almost constantly, every day, and you have to read as much as you can. If there's one uh, fault or, or one thing that uh, I find disturbing about people who profess a desire to be writers of fiction is that uh, you'll hear them say, well, gee, I really don't have time to read. Well, that's crap. Everybody has time to read. Um, if you carry a book with you, then sooner or later you probably will read it. Uh, you might be doing that instead of watching Seinfeld on TV, but that might not be such a bad thing. I sound like I'm scolding you. With I'm really not. What I'm saying is that I think that uh, practice makes perfect, and if you're going to be a writer, you have to write a lot, and you have to write a lot of fiction if you want to be a fiction writer. Have you ever suffered writer's block? Have I ever suffered writer's block? Yes, I have. Um, my method of dealing with it is to keep writing. Um, usually what I write when I have writer's block is very bad. Uh, there are critics out there by the thousands that say you must have writer's block all the time. But, uh, <laughs> hey, what can I say? Everybody's got an opinion, right? Like something else we could name. Um, I tend to write right through it. And it's a scary thing because there's always this feeling that it will will never end. But thankfully, uh, I haven't had too many. And I think that, for me, writer's block is uh, mostly a matter of having idea block. All the ideas seem to fall apart. And when that happens, the only thing you can do is wait. You can't make yourself have an idea. Sometimes if you've had an idea, you can force a development when you need it as part of the fiction-making process. But I've never been able to have an idea on cue. So that's the scary part, is waiting for it to pass. But for the last few years, even at the worst of times, I've always had one idea on the shelf. Sometimes people will say, where do you get your ideas? And I don't know, but I just, that's the trouble. If you knew where you got your ideas, you could go and get one, right? Anytime you want one, you just say, I'll go get that old idea. But I don't know where I get them either. They just sort of slide under the door every once in a while, like Federal Express. Children figure prominently in many of your writings. Why is this? Because I've, I've raised three kids with the help of my wife, of course, and I had a chance to watch them grow, and I'm fascinated by kids um, because they, they live and they work below adult sight lines, um, and they live their own world. 
And I try as hard as I can to resist the uh, r standard romantic cliche thing. Uh, we come trailing clouds of glory behind us. Now, I don't know about William Wordsworth. I don't know if, if he ever had anything to do with raising his one kid, but my kids came, for the most part, trailing clouds of dirty pampers and stuff like that. Uh, there were a lot of messes there. So I try to resist the, the basic romantic idea, but just things about kids that interest me very much that seem to make them open doors to worlds of make-believe and fantasy. Um, I remember one day when I was working on It, which is about kids and grown-ups, and where the change takes place between the one and the other. And I took a lot of walks during the writing of that book to try and think about how I wanted to handle what I wanted to write, because it was long and it was difficult. And it was a scary process that went on for a long time. And as I walked up my street, I saw this little kid, about three years old, sitting in the dust at the side of the road with a stick in her hand. And she was drawing in the dirt and muttering to herself. And then I thought to myself, that's all right. People are walking by this kid, and she's sitting there in the dirt by the side of the road, and she's muttering, and she's drawing with her stick. And people are just walking back and forth because she's three years old. But if I sat down in the dust at the side of the road, well, me, they'd probably think he's just being Steve, you know? But if you were to do that and to sit down and mutter to yourself, to nobody there, and draw with a stick, they'd take you away. So we understand that kids are insane, and we allow them to be insane. <laughs> No, 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 no. Kids, kids talk to people who aren't there. Kids, three, four-year-old kids believe, get this, they believe that there is a purple dinosaur whose teeth are a perfect white ridge inside its mouth, okay, and it dances and it talks. Well, they believe this because they're insane. They believe anything. If you tell them that people can fly, they'll believe that. They'll believe anything at all that you tell them, until the disease of rationality sets in, you know, uh, which it always does sooner or later. When we tell kids enough, act your age, hey, they do. Kids want to be, behave, and uh, the world wants to kick that out of them as soon as possible, and some of us uh, manage to, to sort of hide as much of that fantasy as we can. And uh, then, of course, they want us to come and speak at Halloween when we turn out that way. <laughs> How did Eyes of the Dragon do, and will you write more books geared to young readers? Um, Eyes of the Dragon was a book that was written for my daughter. We were talking about kids, and this is a good follow-up question. Um, all of my, my two boys had read my stuff, and it enjoyed it uh, very, very much. And uh, my daughter hadn't. In fact, l let me tell a real quick story about grow kids growing up in, in my household, uh, because this is something that I'm asked about sometimes. And it bears on uh, one of my guests here today. There's a, a guy here today, an old friend named Doug Winter. And uh, he and his wife and their two boys came up to see us at our place in Western Maine a few years ago. And I think their two boys at that time were probably, I'm going to say, 9 and 11, 9 and 12, something like that. I can't quite remember. But I do know that my own youngest son, Owen, was, was younger than either of the two boys. He was maybe six or something like that. And uh, they were discussing about what movie they were going to watch on, on a videotape that night at the house because we had no TV reception out there. And uh, I had cassettes of all my movies there. And... Uh, Joe, my older son, said, well, why don't we watch Christine? And they're going, yeah, sounds good, sounds good. So Doug's wife, Lynn, stepped in and said they couldn't watch that because it was an R-rated picture and they just simply had a family rule that the kids weren't going to watch R-rated pictures until they were older. And they accepted that with good grace. But remember what I said about the secret world of, of kids. They have their own lives, their own society. It's mostly below the level of adult vision unless you're very lucky. So I happened to be walking by the TV room a little while later, and uh, one of the uh, winter boys was saying to my older son, Joe, but it makes us feel so stupid. Owen can watch that movie, and he's a lot younger than we are. And my son, Joe, re returning in this very serious voice, but you have to remember, he said, my father writes horror. Owen is exposed to this every day of his life. <laughs> you know, 
So you get kind of case hard. And the kids seem to accept that. So, but uh, Naomi didn't really want to have anything to do with that. And so I thought, well, I want to write something to please her if I possibly can. So I wrote The Eyes of the Dragon because she likes dragons. And it had a, you know, a, a brave lord and a beautiful lady in it who had her name. So it was sort of a bribe to do it. Yeah, I'd like to go back and write about that, that world some more. And maybe the, uh, the urge will come. As a former high school teacher, what advice do you have for teachers to motivate their students to read and to loosen up? <laughs> That's a loaded question. I, th I know a lot of teachers who, who are loose, you know. Um, how to make kids read more. It's tough and it's a serious question because the competition is very, very fierce out there. Uh, there's a lot of MTV. I, for years, I've sat in front of the TV with a book. How many, raise your hand, how many of you sit in front of the TV with a book from time to time? If I have on MTV, man, I'm looking at the TV, even if it's something that I don't want to see, because it's totally intrusive on my consciousness. Will, volition doesn't play a part. I just simply can't help, uh, uh, I can't help looking at it. Uh, but the TV is vastly seductive. Videotapes are vastly seductive to kids. Films, the availability of films, the mauling of America, uh, six plexes, eight plexes, ten plexes, hundred plexes, they are immensely seductive to kids. There are a thousand things to take kids away, um, video games, records, whatever, from books. But there's a simple fact that, that remains. It's not a teacher's problem. Whether or not children read is a parent's problem, in my view, entirely. Children, it's as simple as this. Children who grow up in homes where books are available, where parents read, where parents read to them, those kids read. It's as simple as that. If they grow up in a home where people don't read, it's very rare. It's, it's occasional. A kid will pick it up from school from some special teacher. Um, and that's great when it happens, but it's much better uh, if the kids see the books around, they simply pick them up and read them themselves. Parents are still the, the best example, not teachers. Do you have many more stories in you that are totally out of character as a horror writer? Well, <clears throat> as I said before, I would never deny that I'm a horror writer. Uh, you can call me anything that you want. Uh, but I have I never thought of an idea specifically as a horror idea, and I never had an idea that I thought was a good one and rejected it by saying, oh, this, this really isn't a horror novel, so I won't, I won't do that. Um, I basically just sell the rights to these things and let people uh, publish them as they, as they want. And one of the nice things now is that uh, I've been successful enough and lucky enough in my, in my chosen field so that I can write pretty much anything that comes into my head. And probably the anchor, the saving grace there, is that I'm heavily invested in the idea of entertaining people. Um, I've always seen myself as more of a suspense writer than a, than a horror writer. And I, I have a few ideas. I have that one good idea, thank God, that's up on the shelf. And it's a really scary idea, you know. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. I love the idea of frightening people, and I won't kid you about that. I just absolutely love it. I always like to, as we near the end of these things, I like to remind you that wherever all of you left your cars, you know, almost anybody could be in the back seat <laughs> right now. Don't you think that that's a possibility? And uh, I want you to think about that tonight, particularly if you have to go into one of those parking garages where your heels echo, you know, and... <laughs> We're really, there are a lot of hiding places, and anybody could be anywhere and deranged with a sharp object. And when you get home, you never know really what's going to be in the shower stall if the curtain's pulled. I, I take pains myself to always pull the shower curtain back before I leave the house so I can immediately tell when I go in the bathroom <laughs> that the bathtub is unoccupied. Because otherwise, the shadow of that water pick thing falls. And it looks just like some guy like that. I don't have to worry about that. But uh, really, we have to be honest about this, don't we? Anybody could be anywhere in your closet or really. Um, and hey, 
under the bed. That's why I always keep the covers up myself over my feet because they're magic. Uh, criminally insane people and monsters cannot reach through covers, so <laughs> you're safe. And uh, the other thing, and I, I don't think I've ever said this in front of an audience before, that I've made up my mind to do, if I am in bed and a crazy person breaks into my house, I will pretend to be asleep and then he'll leave me alone. So I don't know if that answers the question, but... As a New Englander and a baseball fan, have you considered a horror novel about the Red Sox? <laughs> Let me say before I even try to tackle that question that the best thing about today is that I'm going to be home by tonight to watch the Phillies kick Toronto's ass. That's going to be good. Um, I could never write a horror novel about the Red Sox. I have this love-hate or hate-hate relationship with the Red Sox. Um, I love baseball. I've been a baseball fan for a lot of years. I coached the game at the uh, junior high school level and at the little league level, or I have in previous years. Um, the trouble with, with sports is my wife has kind of staked out this field. She's written a, uh, a basketball novel called One on One, also available at a bookstore near you as we speak, and she's working on a, on a hockey novel. Um, so. The real problem for me is there are too many, darn many characters. But I, just let me point out real quick in passing that my favorite baseball story of all time was, was published in Tales from the Crypt magazine. This is where you have the good baseball team and the bad baseball team. The nice thing about Tales from the Crypt is there were never any shades of gray. There were the good people and there were the bad people. You've read them, right? Guy knows all about it. Anyway, the Good team beats the bad team, and in revenge, the bad team cooks the brakes on the good team's bus so that the good team goes over a cliff and all the members of the good team are killed. And uh, they come back from the dead on the eve of the World Series and end up playing baseball. They've got intestines strung for base pass and a severed leg for a, for a, um, a bat, and the bad pitcher's head becomes the ball. The name of the story is Play Ball, and I've always thought, with that baseball story in this field, who needs another one? Before answering, asking the final question, I'd like to present you with a certificate of appreciation for oh. speaking here today. Thank you. If only I had a blender <laughs> and a cup. A National Press Club mug. And the final question is, you and uh, humor columnist Dave Barry are in a writer's rock band. Which of you is the better musician? Well, I'm more successful. <laughs> I probably have had more bestsellers than Dave, and just because he knows a few more chords, probably 80 or 90 more chords, actually, and he can also uh, sing harmony. So the answer to the question is uh, he's a... Uh, let me put it this way. Dave has won a Pulitzer Prize, and I haven't. Dave plays better guitar than I do, um, Dave can sing harmony. Uh, Dave's got his own TV show, and I don't. But I'm taller. I'm a lot taller. Thank you.